the car market in Mogadishu. NATO's military success against many Western nations. This is on assignment. Welcome to the show, everyone. Coming to you from VOA headquarters in Washington, I'm Alex Villarreal. And I'm Philip Alexio. Coming up, on the ground in Ukraine, we talk to the VOA correspondent who was there. Then it's the U.S. versus China in a battle over cyber crimes. The plight of Coptic Christians in Egypt, why they're worried about their future. And broadcasting daily across Africa, we'll talk with the host of VOA's Africa 54. Stay right there. On Assignment starts right now. Ukraine has been locked in a crisis with Russia since Russian troops moved into the Crimean Peninsula in February. Russia's takeover of Crimea and the rise of a violent pro-Russian separatist movement in eastern Ukraine have revealed a Ukraine divided. Some Ukrainians want to align with Russia, while others believe the country should move closer to the European Union. VOA correspondent Brian Padden went to Ukraine as the tensions in the east were brewing, and I asked him about the situation on the ground when he first arrived, compared to what he expected he'd see. Take a look. I had vague expectations of what I would find. I knew there was protests going on. I didn't know what the level of conflict or violence was at this at this point I, I arrived in mid to late april and when i arrived it was not dangerous and so it was a, a, a very normal type of protest situation i would say right but then how did that change over the course of the time you were there and every day it changed a little bit the next day there would um, separatists started taking over, uh, started creating checkpoints uh, outside of the city and in other cities and then the next day they they took a journalist hostage out in Slavyansk and then the OSCE uh, they were taken hostages in that same town and the Ukrainian military started moving in and this escalated the danger and escalated the tension in the city of Gorlivka, armed militia behind makeshift barricades maintained control of the police station. The group spokesman declined VOA's request for an interview, saying they see no benefit in talking to the media at this time. In the city of Mariupol, Ukrainian forces reported no casualties after clearing the city hall of pro-Russian protesters who had occupied it for more than a week. How is this affecting your everyday average Ukrainian? It, it is affecting them more every day. Uh, early on, I, the protests were, were centered around specific occupied buildings. And outside of those occupied buildings, across the street, down the block, restaurants were open, normal life was going on, offices were, were operating, banks were operating. But little by little, that is changing. Some banks have closed. There's concern now because the police have been overtaken by the separatists. There's not less police on the street. Crime is up in some of these areas. Uh, there is concern now with the Ukrainian military moving in. So there has been more violence and, and people can't move as easily in and out of the city. So it is disrupting more every day. In one of your reports, you included a person who you identified as not wanting to have his last name revealed. Why is that? Some people don't want to have their last names revealed because they, in their minds, hold viewpoints that could get them in trouble either with authorities or with the separatists. So you saw that among a number of people that you talked to. And even amongst a lot of some of the separatists, they did not want to be interviewed. Uh, when we were surrounded at one point in front of this occupied building and we were getting fingers poked in our chest and we were being called propagandists and fascists, they were telling us not to take their picture because they don't want authorities in Kiev to come and arrest them. As a journalist, how do you make sense of a situation like that when you have two sides you know, very strongly against each other and then they're also against you? That last part is the hard part. Uh, when they're against each other, and it was, it was something I was trying to tell the separatists as they were yelling at me and shouting me down, is that VOA would like to represent your point of view in this report. It's a legitimate point of view. You've got hundreds of people out here. How likely is it that we're going to see this end anytime soon? 
I don't know. I don't know. There, if you're an optimist, you see elements. There are elements for peaceful resolution. The military has purposely, I think, to a certain degree, stalled its offensive in the East to avoid civilian casualties, to see if there's some sort of negotiation could take place to kind of prevent this from ending in civil war. Yeah. Russia has backed off a little bit in its public comment. But there are, there, there is a consensus in the country that there should be some limited autonomy for different regions in the country, and that could help diffuse the situation. That's the optimistic view. The pessimistic view is that the, the divide now is so stark and so strong that, uh, not, that it, this will not end without some sort of comp uh, military confrontation. And again, that was VOA's Brian Patton. Our thanks as always to him and video journalist Arash Arabasadi, who traveled with Brian to Ukraine. And of course, everyone can check out our program page on voanews.com to watch the interview we did with Arash last week. Moving on, we'll be taking a short break, but when we come back, I'll talk with our internet security blogger about the latest cyber dust up between China and the United States. You're watching On Assignment. The U.S. Department of Justice has made some headlines by charging members of China's military with hacking into the computers of U.S. companies to steal trade secrets. The charges were a first but came as no surprise. Experts say China for years has been trying to steal data from U.S. corporations, interest groups, media, and even the government. Uh, joining me now for more is Doug Bernard. He is our VOA online security and uh, freedom blogger. So, Doug, what exactly is the United States charging China with? Well, first and foremost, uh, exactly nobody is surprised that a lot of hacking is coming from China. Uh, the U.S. government has been complaining about this, as have corporations for years. What's new in this indictment is that for the first time, the U.S. government is saying elements of the Chinese government, specifically the army, and specific individuals are responsible for intentionally hacking into U.S. private corporate computers with the intent to steal research and trade secrets. And as I understand it, they were able to actually track the individuals themselves as opposed to the location. Which really is a first time uh, event and, and very difficult. There's a lot of forensics that went into actually putting this indictment together. And so you've talked with some of the analysts who have been looking at the techniques that they right. use. So have they been doing anything unique? Uh, not unique, but what's interesting, I think, is this was not a one-and-done kind of hack. Uh, this was relatively sophisticated, long-term, uh, and required a lot of research. What the Chinese did is they used something that we would call social engineering. So that's basically uh, tricking somebody uh, into thinking that you're trustworthy and that you're somebody other than who you actually are. So why is the U.S. alleging that the Chinese military is involved in hacking U.S. sites, but right. uh, there are corporate and not state secrets that are said to be targeted. So why the corporate interests? Why corporate interests and why the army, I think, are two good questions. Uh, first, to corporate interests. Uh, I think a lot of analysts would tell you that Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, lag behind the U.S. in terms of uh, intellectual patents, uh, research development, that kind of stuff. So this uh, hacking can give these Chinese firms an unfair leg up. Uh, also remember, look, uh, corporations, I think, don't always really have very good network security. Uh, U.S. government is pretty good about keeping information secret on its computers, so the corporations, I think, were an easy target. Now, why the military? Uh, well, one analyst I spoke with uh, put it this way. When you have an important job to do, you send in the A-team. Right. And in China, the A-team is the military. Okay, and so and the, the other way around, though, China certainly has been... Uh, making a tit for tat. Yeah. Uh, I guess I should say China basically making frequent allegations against the U.S. for doing the same thing. Exactly. Uh, and they have, they have accused the U.S. of uh, spying. Look, everybody spies. Everybody hacks. Uh, I don't think in the U.S. case you have to go much further than just saying Edward Snowden. Uh, the difference is, I think, the Chinese allegations have been just that, rumor and allegations and never proven. What's it new and interesting here is that the U.S. government is saying not only do we know you're doing this, but now we can prove it. All right, VOA is Doug Bernard, our cyber expert here at uh, Voice of America. Thanks a lot, Doug. Thank you. 
All right, time for a uh, short break, but uh, on the other side, the uh, plight of Egypt's Coptic Christians. You're watching On Assignment. About 10% of Egyptians belong to the Coptic faith, making them the Middle East's largest Christian minority. But these Copts have become targets of violence. Since the revolution in Egypt three years ago, many churches were destroyed in a rampage last August, and Copts report regular intimidation. With elections in May and the uh, struggle between the Egyptian military and Islamists continuing, many Copts are worried about the future of their ancient church. VOA religion correspondent Jerome Sokolovsky visited a Coptic church outside Washington and he talked with On Assignment's Rebecca Ward about the Copts' struggles and their history. Copts consider themselves the original Christians and the original Egyptians. Uh, they say that their church was founded by Mark the Evangelist, one of Jesus' disciples uh, who went down to Egypt way back when and uh, founded the church. And they've had a tough time ever since, pretty much. Theirs is a story of persecution throughout the 20 centuries of their existence. Paul Giergis is an American-born priest at St. Mark's Coptic Orthodox Church in suburban Washington. Since the beginning, he says, Copts have known suffering. There was an uh, emperor that said, um, I'm going to massacre the Christians until the blood in the streets reaches to the knees of my horse. Cops are enduring what some call their latest pogrom since the Egyptian revolution three years ago. They say that the violence, this latest wave of violence, began uh, when the Muslim Brotherhood came to power. And of course there was a coup against the, the Brotherhood uh, about a year ago. And things have gotten better, but not entirely. And they're still uh, concerned about their future. For example, when the uh, security forces in Egypt uh, had a crackdown against a mother Muslim brother, Brotherhood encampment. Uh, in the next 24 hours, scores of churches were attacked, some burned to the ground. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, a, a young Coptic woman was uh, attacked by a mob and murdered. And they say this happened because she had a cross hanging from the mirror in her car. What did the Coptic Christians that you spoke to say about what they'd like perhaps the United States to do or the uh, international community to fight back against this violence? Well, the main thing they want is more pressure on the government in, in Cairo uh, to uh, protect Copts. They feel that the Obama administration has not spoken out as much as perhaps uh, some leaders in Europe uh, who are now. Prince Charles did uh, talk about Christians in the Middle East uh, in particular, Pope Francis has, has brought attention, attention to it. Uh, there's lobbying going on. There's a, a, an organization called Coptic Solidarity that's uh, active here in Congress, uh, lobbying members. Uh, President Obama did mention Christians and Copts in his uh, speech at the Na National Prayer Breakfast last February. Um, but there are Christian groups in the United States who say he hasn't followed up enough, that he actually spends more time talking about persecution of, of gays abroad than he does about Christians. Now what is the uh, population of Coptic Christians in Egypt compared to the rest of the population? Well the, the actual figure is hard to come by. Historically the, the, the government has played down the number of Copts there. It's believed that at least 10 percent of uh, the Egyptian population is Coptic. Now there's been a big exodus uh, since the Arab Spring uh, to places like the U.S. and Europe and Australia. And they don't have this, or, or do they have the same rights as uh, Muslim c citizens of Egypt? Right. As, as citizens, they do have the same rights as, as Muslims. It's more, as, as far as I know, the um, organizationally. Copts have always had, certainly in the modern era, have had uh, restrictions placed upon them. They couldn't just build a church anywhere. There was a lot of red tape. There were limits on the height of churches. So it's been a community that's um, seen itself as uh, second-rate citizens. 
I think one of the interesting things as far as what it's like to be a cop in Egypt, um, I had an interesting conversation with a young Coptic woman uh, out at the church in Fairfax. Sandy Solomon was out in Cairo with her mother and aunt. The looks, the language, the um, even the body language, it was very threatening body language with the closeness of people who are interacting with you. Coptic women do not, uh, are not veiled. And with more and more women, Muslim women in Egypt being veiled, uh, it's easier and easier to define them, to, to identify them. And many of them say as a result of that, there's more harassment. And they see it as part of an effort to, you know, explicit or implicit, to degrade their, their community, to, to humiliate them as a, as a people. All right, Jerome Sokolovsky, VOA's religion reporter. Well, speaking of Voice of America, we broadcast in more than 40 languages around the world. In Africa, we can be heard in several languages, including English. And one of VOA's English TV programs is the news magazine show, Africa 54. A show not unlike our own show on assignment in many ways. And the host of Africa 54 is Vincent McCory. I got the chance to chat with Vincent about the show and how it connects with viewers across the continent. Check it out. Hello and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory and this is Africa 54. Africa 54 is a news magazine program. The program has a, is a mix of uh, big news, uh, analysis of the news of the day, but also nice features and packages that look into some unique uh, developments on the continent. Uh, could be economic issues, social issues. Viewers Maria Madiallo takes a closer look. One of the themes of this year's observance of World Press Freedom Day is the media's importance. So when people hear this name, Africa 54, what does the 54 stand for? Well, 54 stands for the African countries. Uh, they are officially 54 African countries, members of the Africa Union. And that includes South Sudan, right? Which exactly, is a that includes yes. South Sudan. Yes. yes. So if another country comes along, you might have to change to Africa uh, maybe 55. Maybe we may have to change to Africa 55. <laughs> you just hope that the country is not going to be disintegrating into so many other countries. Absolutely, you know? yeah, let's exactly. Stay, let it stay intact for right. now. Tell us about the team when that works on Africa 54 and what goes into putting the program together. It's a fabulous team. I can say that almost everybody who is reporting uh, on Africa and who is uh, doing an English uh, report or programming is almost working with us. Uh, so if we start with the then correspondents the on the ground, uh, almost on a daily vacuum. basis, we are so getting um, good reports from West Africa, from East Africa, from Southern Africa, from our great and courageous reporters. For more on the missing school girls, viewers Heather Maddock and our joins us from Nigeria's capital, capital Abuja. Heather, hi. And then here in Washington, D.C., we have a fabulous small team, but we do a wonderful job covering stories that are relevant to our viewers in Africa. Joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent, Lino Madu. Hello, Lino. Hello, Vincent. Hello, everyone. More than 60 people have died after drinking from a batch of illegal liquor in Kenya. Well, we're evaluating that very, very closely. One we're, of your you know, recent uh, notable guests was Secretary of State John Kerry. That's you had correct. the chance to interview him. Yes. Tell us about that and what struck you about what he said. It was very, very interesting interviewing him and I think it was an honor. Uh, what I can say struck me about him is that uh, he showed passion uh, for the continent of Africa. We spoke about so many things, uh, including the conflict in South Sudan and the Central African Republic and the, uh, the terrorist uh, attacks in, in uh, Nigeria and East Africa. What is the U.S. doing right now to help that country? Well, we're working very closely with our allies and with our partners and friends. We've been providing uh, assistance. We've been providing direct lift, aircraft, other things to help people go in. He personally said that uh, some of these issues get so close to him. He's been so involved, for example, in South Sudan uh, way before this current uh, uh, ongoing conflict because he had an interest in seeing that South Sudan becomes an independent nation and that peace prevails in that part of the region. So you see passion uh, um, uh, f from him on issues that affect 
human beings uh, in Africa, it strikes you that it's not somebody who's just doing a job, mm. uh, but it's uh, someone who is involved and touched by what's happening across the continent. I talked to uh, the leaders of Uganda, of Ethiopia, elsewhere. You know, speaking uh, about being touched by what's happening, you are from the continent yourself. Yeah. You're from Kenya. Yes. So what's it like for you being a journalist here in the United States and being able to report on these issues related to Africa to Africans yes. from here? First, it, I think it's a great privilege to have an opportunity to be practicing journalism from here and focusing on uh, my motherland, uh, the continent of Africa. It, one, uh, one unique thing is that it gives you this, uh, I could say, uh, wider perspective of the continent. I'm able to see what's happening across the continent from north to south, west to east, and have a kind of a, almost a, an outsider perspective while at the same time being an insider with a certain deep understanding of the issues. We get a lot of feedback and uh, we are grateful that many people are watching the program from across the continent. For all of us here in Washington, have a good night. And our thanks to Mr. Vincent McCory for that look into Africa 54. Well, moving now from African television to music. In Senegal, hip-hop may still be a man's world, but more women are breaking into the so-called urban arts. A local NGO in Dakar is holding workshops to train the country's next generation of female hip-hop artists. VOA's Ann Look has the story. Hip-hop looks like fun, but it takes some serious work. That was the refrain of these workshops for young women in Dakar, organized by the local non-governmental organization called Afrique Jobin. For the aspiring rappers, it was an intense week of writing, rewriting, laying down tracks and performing. The women collaborated on two songs, one of them a Take Me As I Am anthem, and the other on the theme Free Voice. I'm saying it's time to give women a chance to say what they want to say in hip-hop, the same chance that men get to express themselves. But they can't keep waiting on men to invite them in, says one of them, who goes by the name Sister LB. I know sooner or later I'm going to be somebody. That's what matters. I believe in myself. It's not you who's going to help me make it. I have to help myself so you can help me. Industry insiders here say female artists need the polished skills and resources to turn professional. Prominent Senegalese rapper KT coached them on their writing. Up to now, it's been the two extremes. The women acting like tomboys are trying to be Rihanna. Can we get to a point where female Senegalese rappers just get up on stage and be who they really are without feeling like they have to play a part? The event's MC Muna, who is also a rapper, said that's easier said than done in the mainstream. Let's be honest, people love us when we wear mini skirts and heels, but when you come as an intellectual with something clear and smart to say, there's a problem. People get annoyed. You are no longer a doll. That's not stopping this new generation of female rappers from taking on big issues in their verse. Motherhood, love, poverty, education. When they take that mic, they say their voice must speak for thousands. And look, VOA News, Dakar. All right, and with that story about rap, we are wrapping up another show. Uh, very clever. But before we go, we want to send a shout out to viewers watching us on RTV and Barajevo, Serbia. And of course, everyone can watch us anytime on our program page on the website, voanews.com, as well as YouTube and Facebook. That's correct. Uh, stick around for some more coming up next week. For Alex and myself, we'll see you then.